Welcome to the ninth annual Commonwealth Short Story Prize. I'm your host, Shelley King. I'd like to thank you all for joining us from your many different time zones around the world. We're here to celebrate the winners of the 2020 Commonwealth Short Story Prize. Usually, our prize ceremony takes place in a Commonwealth country and brings together the winners, local artists, and the local audience. This year is going to be a little different. The 2020 prize ceremony is online, free to all, and everyone is invited to attend. Now more than ever, as we deal with being separated from our loved ones, it feels important to share stories to connect us. So make sure you join the conversation using our hashtag at the bottom of the screen. Also, since we're streaming, you can engage with everyone else who's watching using our chat room. So please say hello. This year, we received more than 5,000 entries from 49 Commonwealth countries. The prize is free to enter and accepts entries in 11 different languages. No other literary prize is as global or as diverse. Our judges have chosen what they feel is the best unpublished short story from each of the Commonwealth's five regions. Let's meet our five regional winners. Innocent Chizaram Ilo, Africa. Kritika Pande, Asia. Rhea Martin, Canada and Europe. Brian S. Heap, Caribbean. Andrea E. McLeod, Pacific. Each of these talented writers receives an award of 2,500 pounds. One of them is the overall winner of this year's Commonwealth Short Story Prize and will take home 5,000 pounds. Before we tell you who it is, let's meet Anne Gallagher, the Director General of the Commonwealth Foundation, and Nee Parks, who had the enviable task of being this year's Chair of the Judging Process. Hello. Well, what a pleasure this is. Our first virtual short story prize ceremony. This is an extraordinary event being held in extraordinary times. The Commonwealth is home to 2.4 billion citizens, nearly a third of humanity. It's an organisation of countries, but it is of and for the people of the Commonwealth. Our job at the Foundation is to bring the people in, to do everything possible to connect Commonwealth citizens with each other, to make their voices heard on matters that affect their lives. The Commonwealth Short Story Prize is at the heart of this, part of the Foundation's broader cultural program. We are so proud of the prize, proud of the number and range of entries it attracts, proud of the quality of the stories we receive, proud of the fact that for many Commonwealth writers, success in the prize has proven to be life-changing. With the world beset by problems of epic scale, it's been an immense privilege to be able to escape into the universes created by the stories entered for the Commonwealth Short Story Prize. They offered glimpses of hope when the real world didn't. Defiant, funny, tragic and uplifting, the stories were grounded in the humanity we all share. A real pleasure to read and a headache to narrow down to a short list, let alone just one winner. We had a team of more than 30 readers and translators from across the Commonwealth involved in selecting the stories that went to our judges. Having an accomplished panel of judges to work alongside was absolutely crucial to homing in on a selection of stories that we believe have what it takes to win the Commonwealth Short Story Prize. This year's judges were, from Africa, Mohale Moshigo, author of the best-selling novel, The Yearning. From Asia, William Fuan, executive director of the Singapore Book Council. From Canada and Europe, Heather O'Neill, novelist, poet, screenwriter, and winner of enough awards that I don't have the time to list them all. From the Caribbean, Elizabeth Walcott Hackshaw, professor of French literature and creative writing at the University of the West Indies. From the Pacific, Nick Lowe, award-winning writer, installation artist, and explorer. The magic that happens when a story encounters a ready reader or listener means that none of the judges on their own would have selected the same shortlist or the same winners from the five regions. 
Our long, fun discussions on glow-spanning video calls forced us to articulate our unique takes and agree on which stories had the right combination of craft, invention, surprise, and boldness to be named winners. Our thanks to all the readers and judges who work so hard to find the very best short stories from around the Commonwealth. You've brought us a treasure trove that we're delighted to share. The Foundation takes the task of promoting its winners very seriously. All the winning regional stories are published online in the literary magazine Granta. And every one of our shortlisted stories is published by the Foundation's own online magazine, Ada. The Commonwealth Short Story Prize is not only a unique and inclusive opportunity for writers all over the Commonwealth, it can also launch winners into successful careers doing what they love most, writing and telling stories that are inspiring and thought-provoking. Many of our previous winners have built on their success in the prize and found homes for their work at major publishing houses. We wish each and every one of our regional winners the same. Let's take this opportunity to meet some of our previous winners and catch up with what they've been doing. Imagine a dark room with no light in it. And suddenly you have a window that opens somewhere and you have a shaft of light coming in. That's what it was like for me when I won in 2015 the regional prize. It gave me a platform and amplified my voice. And to me, that's invaluable. I won the regional prize in 2012 and 2017, and that's how I found an agent and a publisher. The Commonwealth Prize brought global attention to my writing, and that was massive for me. The prize was why an experimental novel like Cow and Company worked out. After the announcement, Penguin wrote saying they'd like to see the manuscript and that's how it got published. It has also provided me many opportunities since winning the prize. Um, I've signed on to an agency since then and I'm currently um, in the middle of working on my next novel. Winning this prize means a lot more than being a good writer. It means that I was able to touch the souls and hearts of the people of the great Commonwealth family. The prize opened a lot of doors professionally and I was able to uh, secure an agent and uh, eventually a book deal. And my first novel has just been published, Love After Love, and I owe that uh, to the Commonwealth Short Story Prize. Now, I'm delighted to say it's time to check in with our regional winners and hear extracts from their winning stories read by our very special guests. I'm so grateful to the Commonwealth Writers and Granta for this amazing opportunity. Being a writer in Australia today, there are so many incredible and important voices, including emerging and established First Nations writers, writers challenging us with what climate change means for us and our neighbouring countries, what it means to be part of a multicultural society and our responsibilities to the earth. There have been many times when I have wondered, why do I write? Why do I interpret events around me by imagining certain people and the things that they say and do? To reach this stage of the competition and to realise that this story has been able to say the things that I hoped it would and that it has spoken to the judges is the most humbling experience. It is validating and it is so joyful after so many years of writing. There is no other competition like the Commonwealth Writers Short Story Prize in bringing so many diverse voices together. Congratulations to the other regional prize winners and the exceptional writers on the shortlist. I'm so thrilled to introduce acclaimed New Zealand actress, Kerry Fox, to read from my story, The Art of Worthy. I know an Iranian woman called Anoushe, who's my age and works as a receptionist at the local dentist. Sometimes she waves when I walk past the dentist surgery and I wave back. We had some classes together in school, which is why I wave. I remember in English sometimes the teacher would ask her to write stories about what it was like in Iran, but instead she wrote about how a goat her cousin owned followed her to school. Someone asked, did the goat get killed in the war? And she said, no, the goat is not dead. It lives with my uncle. We told Anoushe she could talk to us about her experiences in Iran because we understood 
which was what the teacher told us to say. When new refugees arrived on the small clapped out refugee crisis centre bus and drove right past a group of us standing at the bus stop, everyone except me waved. Everyone on the bus waved to us, except Anoushe. Anoushe is the only person other than my sister that I've met who understood. Everyone expected Anoushe to have shrapnel scars or burns somewhere on her body from when the bombs fell on her house because this is what we imagined happened to her. They thought she probably wanted to tell them the story about the Iranian scientist who left his wife and daughter at home and riding to work on his motorbike was blown up, perhaps because someone thought he was a supervisor at the plant where scientists were suspected of working on creating a nuclear weapon or how towards the end of the Iran-Iraq war in 1988, a US Navy ship called USS Vincenzes shot down Iran Air Flight 655, killing all civilian passengers on board. But Anusha didn't want to talk about any of that. She didn't say much at all. One day, when she got undressed in the showers, some of the girls climbed the cubicle to get a better look. But She didn't have any scars that they could see either. I still think everyone was amazed when she finally told us this ordinary story about how nobody stops for anyone crossing the road in Iran, meaning so many people die every year just stepping out onto the street. It was probably a year after she told us that story that we learned this was how her mother had died. Anoushe had been holding her mother's hand when a truck hit them. I learned this because someone told someone who passed it on until I was told. When a local boy was killed recently at a crossing on a walk sign, the Nushe, which means fortunate, was quiet for a week. She did not wave to anyone. I tell my sister, you know that girl, Anushe, who works for the dentist? My sister says yes, and then disapprovingly, the one you wave at, I say, yes. I think she was lying about the goat. Hello, Um, it's been a thrilling journey from entering for the prize to getting shortlisted and finally to the stage of winning the original prize. I am honoured and deeply humbled to represent the African region for this year's Commonwealth Short Story Prize. I stand in the shadows of all the African writers who have been here before me, particularly Leslie Neka Arima, whose works are so monumental to my craft as a writer. Now, I would love to introduce a Booker Award winning writer Bernardin Evaristo to read an extract from my story, When a Woman Renounces Motherhood. Thank you. Mama, good afternoon. Nwaka ego, ebatago, you are back. Her mother's response is forlorn. She does not even stand up to hug Nwaka ego and say una or ask how Lagos's heat has dealt with her one and only daughter. Kapa. Kapa, the loom's wooden frame bounces away. Mama, keke ime, how are you? Nuaka ego goes over to the loom and hugs her mother's shoulder. It is supple now, the shoulder. The last time she visited, her mother was so bony, she had to buy an extra tin of Ovaltine and peak milk. I have never felt this good in a long time, Nuaka ego's mother says. She snips a knotted thread with a pair of scissors, straightens the fabric so as not to tangle the warps with the wefts and stops weaving. Her face glows when she looks up at her daughter, the seemingly permanent wrinkles and blemishes all gone. I am leaving the lapa I will wear tomorrow in front of Undi Umuna and tell the whole world I am done being a mother. Apart from the frayed edges of the lapa, the weaving is almost done. Wavy red and blue lines run across its warm black background. What happened, Mama? Why are you renouncing it now? Go and ask that pig. He is not a pig, Mama. He is still my father. 
Nwaka'ego pulls up a low stool from under the loom and sits down. For 30 years, I have soaked my palms in boiling water for that ye ye man. I have never asked for any payment or reward or even a spiteful thank you. I can tolerate your father gambling and drinking, away the small money he makes from his vulcanizing business, but I will not allow him to rub cow shit on my face. To think that I gave up everything I would have become and followed that man. His dreams, if he had any, were mine. Your father beat me because I realized that he would bring one of those chicken peri-peri girls that serve food at Mama Tiro's restaurant into this house as his new wife. I swore by the mushrooms on my mother's grave never to allow it to happen. Nwaka'ego's mother blinks and flicks off the cluster of tears clinging to her lower eyebrow. Lagos is a long journey. Go and rest, Nwaka'ego. Nwaka'ego slumps on the thin mattress at the foot of the loom, closes her eyes and begs for sleep to come. Kapa, kapa. The loom continues to work the edges of the lapper. If you, like me, are a young woman from Jharkhand, then you must have immense caste and class privilege to get an education in the first place. And even if you do, you'd be expected to get married as soon as you finish college. I chose to read and write instead. Messing up was never an option because then so many young women back home would be told, see, this is why you shouldn't get too big for your boots. I'm honored beyond words to be the regional winner for Asia in the 2020 Commonwealth Short Story Prize. And I hope this helps more people trust their daughters and their dreams. I'm also thrilled that Swara Bhaskar would be reading an excerpt of my short story. I'm a big fan of hers because she understands her responsibilities as a public figure. She's someone who'd explain the Israel-Palestine conflict with a full face of makeup and immaculate smoky eyes. By dismantling this beauty versus intelligence binary that pigeonholes so many of us, Swara does a great job at humanizing women. So, as you can imagine, I'm freaking out. The great Indian tea and snakes is out of sugar. The girl walks to the grocery store. Tiny rocks push into the soles of her feet through the cracks in her chappals. Once, she had stolen a pair of cat-printed chappals from outside the temple, but they have been lying under her bed ever since. She worries that the owner may spot them and take them away. The grocer is an old man who is partially deaf. The TV in the store needs to be pounded from time to time to keep the images from splintering. The place is packed during the cricket season when people stop by to watch an over or two praise or curse Thoni. After purchasing the sugar, the girl is too caught up watching on TV the magnified insides of somebody's mouth being cleansed by a toothpaste that tastes like turmeric to notice when the boy appears next to her. He asks the man for chewing gum. Hey, he says to the girl. Oh, hi. The boy is standing right next to her in a place where her father's gaze is not upon them. She can touch the kite-shaped birthmark on that neck if she wanted to. The man has left a pack of gum on the counter before returning his attention to the TV. Nice to see you outside the stall for a change, he says. Same. You'll make a good Beyonce, probably better than Beyonce herself. The girl touches her bindi, smiling, telling herself, that she was wrong about the boy having a girlfriend at school. Won't you offer me chewing gum? Absolutely. The girl chews the gum until it's time to go to bed. Then she swallows it. The girl examines ordinary objects with newfound fascination. A matchbox, a potato, freight trucks on the road, the ground beneath her feet, thinking that nothing is bigger or smaller than it should be. Everything is the perfect size. She air dries her shampooed hair in the afternoon sun instead of twisting it up in a towel. She wonders if this is how girls become women. One night, when she's putting a broken cup back together, soiled with the kima eater saliva, blood gushes out of her finger like water from the pump. Nevertheless, unlike the brides whose hands she paints with henna, she feels no need for a husband and a house and a washing machine and a baby, 
and a mixer grinder to be content. All she needs is for the boy in the white skull cap to drink chai and eat samosas at the stall so she can watch him watch her. First of all, I want to say how delighted I am that I have reached the awards um, section of the Commonwealth Short Story Prize. Um, it means a great deal to me. I, I was delighted to have made, made it through to the last 20 um, from so many wonderful entries from all over the world. Um, I'm particularly happy to accept the award on behalf of Jamaica because Jamaica has produced so many wonderful story writers, storytellers, and um, it's great to be somebody who's been inspired by these um, stories um, and to have been able to go on and write something of my own. Finally, um, I'm delighted to introduce to you uh, Miss Leila Bertrand, um, very accomplished actor, uh, who has very, very kindly agreed to read an excerpt from my story, Mafutu. Thank you so much. Evadne is not a big churchgoer. In the early days, she and Ubert had gone for worship in the private homes of other Jamaicans, as much for the social and moral support as the spiritual. Later on, she began to find their company tedious. I didn't come all this way here with you to, to create Jamaica all over again in foreign, she told her husband. Instead, choosing to struggle against a ferocious headwind, she worked her way through the bigotry, rejection and racism and did her own thing. How else was she to have a career, or ever to make her own way in this grey and alien place? Her maroon ancestors had been labelled as traitors by some other Jamaicans for their treaties with the British, and for returning runaways to the very masters who enslaved them. But Ebony was having none of that. You needed to lie yourself with those who knew the ways to survive, who knew how to become invisible, how to merge with the landscape. So she went to an Anglican church, blended into the mixed congregation, detached. No pressure to join in any hearty fellowship. Ebony attended mainly for the hymns, which she enjoyed singing in her rich contralto voice, noted more for its volume than its tunefulness. A voice better designed for calling across wide valleys or for bouncing off sheer mountain slopes. Nevertheless, she was enthusiastic and was it particularly fond of Charles Wesley's hymn, And Can It Be That I Should Gain? She liked it because it was a hymn that posed questions, unlike so many others that made enormous assumptions about the depths of one's faith. Amazing love, how can it be that thou my God shouldst die for me? And the imagery of chains falling off with the accompanying release into freedom held a particular resonance for her. At this time in her life, many of Emily's friends were now transitioning, another euphemism for death that she had actually grown to associate, thanks again to Basil Jr. Or something called gender reassignment. So she continued to alarm people with unfiltered, disarmingly forthright condolences. Sorry to hear your husband dead, to an already distraught widow, or the man all healthy and doing his daily joy in one minute, and next thing you know, him dropped down dead like a nit. Not for her, those lofty, evasive expressions like moving to another phase of life, or elevating to a higher plane, or entering into the glory, or even returning to the ancestors or Mother Earth. Him dead? The question is directed to a slightly plumped, freckled nurse with red hair wearing a navy blue tunic and matching trousers. Getting to this stage of the competition feels really amazing. 
I didn't expect it at all. But I'm really grateful that it's happened and it feels like a dream come true. I keep having to pinch myself to believe that I'm a regional winner. Coming from Scotland, it's amazing because I've got such a support in the arts from storytellers to other writers who are always willing to read and encourage my work. And in fact, these are the people who encouraged me to enter the competition in the first place. I'm really grateful to Commonwealth Writers for making this happen. I'd just like to thank them for the opportunity. I'm also delighted that actress Elizabeth McGovern is going to read an extract from my story and I hope you enjoy it. News is a while coming from out of town. It's in the Sunday papers and it reaches the grand houses three days late. Crosses the green lawns, skirts the sheds and hose pipes. The kids bounce up on their knees behind white fences, having their faces behind their hands, shouting to the mailmen. The mailmen jump, laugh with their mouths, but not their eyes. Measure their steps up to the mailboxes, kicking up dirt. The kids hold newspapers like banners. They fight over who gives daddy the news. They fight over who drinks his last sip of coffee, licking slips of thick foam from their mouths. And Mama cooks, and Daddy reads, and the children squabble till he takes his bath in the upstairs room. He does his reading in the Sunday bath, tells Mama everything worth telling. She lies with him as he dries, laid up like a slab of meat in the heat through the window. She's waiting on the stories, but he's awful quiet today. All the fathers are quiet today. There's a lot of reading in Sunday papers. Too much reading. Gives all the fathers a headache. They call their wives into the bedroom and promises the children coffee tomorrow if they just get out and play. The children go. Then, quieter than flies, they daddy spit and stutter. Mr. Jensen's gone, Louisa. Him and that great big dog. Says here he killed himself in the night. Their wives look sticky with guilt. They fold their hands and sink their heads and the children know bad things is coming. They's backed up against the thin wall, holding their hands up in their faces to stifle the sound of their breath. A couple of them gasp, using words they mamas don't like. They get so caught up in listening, bodies scrunched together, but they don't understand, so it makes for more stories. One and two and three at a time, the kids sidle off over to the old bike sheds. They fumble in the musky dark. Nostrils burnt with the sweet oil smell, the rust crawling up the handlebars. Somewhere in every grand house, every mama is crying. Every daddy got a headache from reading the Sunday papers. Every kid gone out to play. There's only the rasp of a dry, dusty wind. That and the soft hiss of tires zipping on the dusty road. That was a taster of the remarkable winning stories. If you'd like to read them all, you can get them in a limited edition collection published by Paper and Ink. Now the time has come to announce the overall winner of this year's Commonwealth Short Story Prize. So let's join Nee Park's Chair of the Judges via video link as he gives the good news to this year's overall winner. That's when the writing is best, when it's both the triggers that you put in and then the life that it takes of its own that gives back and, and you're responding. And, and I think because you've woven all of these things in, it makes a story beautifully complex. And, you know, I think for that reason, we have decided that you are the winner of the Commonwealth Prize. You're joking. Oh my God, really? Oh my God, oh God, this is, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Your reactions got me almost in tears now. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anything you would like to say about the journey or whatever? I would just like to say that this is a very incredible moment for me uh, because like, you know, I like all my 
aspirational middle class people my parents wanted me to become an engineer and i went to an engineering college and i hated it and there's no way in india you can stop going to like if you're a middle class person you can't just stop going to college and then switch because you know my father only had so much money so once he's put me through college i had to finish it and i did and my parents uh, you know because they couldn't afford the kind of education that they managed to provide me they were very conservative and they are still and they wanted me to marry a certain kind of guy and have a certain kind of life and i said no i just want to write and i you know i'm supposed to have had two children already <laughs> i'm supposed to have been married and be living in india but i'm doing this thing and to to get this award and this recognition is so reassuring it tells me that i i was not wrong after all like i was following something that is leading me somewhere and i've lived with so much guilt uh, for letting my parents down you know so this is really like it really makes up for so much of that struggle that i i went through huge congratulations um Thank you and so i think you're well on your way i mean i i think it comes from like you say you're telling other people's stories and that means you have to listen and i think as writers if we develop that ability to listen then we're able to speak in that way because it means we're not only speaking from our own perspective right and so everything has to be moderated through the filter of okay what does this mean for somebody else mm-hmm. uh, and if you have that sensitivity which you know is is massively evident in your work then i have no fear or doubt that you know you will be creating some really fantastic work in the years to come so Um this is my first time speaking to you. I hope it's not my last. And uh, and good luck with everything. Thank you so much. Good luck to you too. Many congratulations, Kritika and all of the regional winners. Now on behalf of Commonwealth Writers and the Commonwealth Foundation, I would like to thank you for joining us and for giving us the opportunity to share our stories with you. Please remember The 2021 Commonwealth Short Story Prize will open for submissions between September 1st and November 1st, 2020. As always, it's free to submit, so send in your story. We would love to read it. Now that's it for me. Thank you all for watching.